Romans 15, this is our second to last week. Next week will be our last week in our series in the book of Romans. Romans 15. I didn't mention during announcements, I intended to, the scripture memory challenge. Don't forget about that. In case you're wondering how I'm doing with my miles, uh, last week so few folks said scripture that I had to run four and a half extra miles just for my own personal benefit and wish that people had learned enough scripture. So uh, the scripture memory challenge, you learn any verse of the scripture and uh, do so for the first time for the scripture memory challenge, then I'll memorize the same verse of the scripture and I will run a mile for every mile or for every verse that you run as well. So you say, Pastor, it's hard to memorize. Well, it's hard to run a mile. And so if you're willing to make effort, I'm willing to make effort as well. And I almost feel as though I should be able to build up a credit of miles. But I don't know if that will do any good because people aren't, they don't want to um, work for suffering that has happened in my past. They want to work so that I'll suffer in the future. And so memorize scripture and I'll suffer for it. By the way, I need to. I've been just humiliated going out running. I, I, I just haven't gotten enough running done. Uh, Brother Charlie is about the same amount overweight as I am, and I'm sure he doesn't mind me saying that. Um, and cold turkey goes out and runs last week. I can't catch the guy. Just whew, going around. Brother Alex, you know, laps me once or twice on the four and a half mile track. So I need to do a lot of running, and you need to do a lot of scripture memory. And so help us out. Help me get in shape. So anyway, there's the challenge. So we've thrown down the gauntlet and um, rise to the occasion. Don't ex listen. Be the kind of people that take a challenge. And I challenge you, memorize scripture and see if you can. I'm just amazed. I'm almost, you know how Pharaoh hardened his heart in the Old Testament and finally God had to heart. I'm, I'm getting a hard heart about this thing as far as I'm kind of getting, you know, Pharaoh gets these plagues and after this terrible plague in Egypt, you know, he, they asked him to, when they, it was the plague of the frogs and there were frogs everywhere. Not just like, you know, just frogs everywhere. You go to bed, frogs, get up, there's frogs. Stepping on frogs, walking on frogs, crunchy, munchy frogs. And God is, uh, you go to eat dinner, you know, and you get your bowl of cereal, a frog pops out of it. There's frogs everywhere. And Pharaoh um, goes to Moses and says, ask God to remove this plague. And Pharaoh he says, says <laughs> frog legs fried for Moses sure. Says yeah, Moses says when, he says tomorrow. You know, I, me, I'd have said today. But that's a hard heart. Well, you know, that's called hubris is what Pharaoh had. You know what hubris is? I survived, so I'm the winner. I survived, so I win. You ever made it the little, it's like the little brother thing. I don't know if anybody here ever had a little brother. But when you beat your little brother, he never gives up. You just, uh, you, you can take him. My brother, I could always beat him at wrestling. I could always take him down. He could start a scrap or fight. And all brothers do this. So don't look at me like I'm terrible for beating up my little brother. Um, <laughs> I still beat my little brother once a year, whether he needs it or not. You have to do that as older brother. The day older brother gets beat by little brother is when he's dead and gone and he kicks him in the grave. Anyway, uh, you can all, that's just, there's rules about that. There are family rules, and you should know those things. Well, um, you know, my little brother, you could beat him, but he'd never admit it, never admit defeat. And so the way he'd win would be, you know, stay mad, and you let him go, and he'd attack you and go at it again, you know. And so... That's kind of the way I feel about the miles, you know. I can run the miles, but if I come out at the end of the week and I've caught up, you guys haven't got me yet. So memorize the scripture, I'll survive it. And uh, I just, I don't know, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm really having a hard time. You're, you're hurting me. You're, I'm struggling with pride right now, feeling as though you can't memorize enough scripture to run me into the ground. <laughs> and so I don't know if I can throw the challenge out there any more than that. You're hurting me. And uh, I need to memorize scripture. I need to run miles. I'm out of shape. And you're just not doing your job. So there you go. Romans chapter 15. <clears throat> Hope you don't take me too seriously when I'm in jest. But I do want you to learn scripture. Romans chapter 15. Seems like a long time since we've been together. We've had a few breaks and pauses as in our study through the book of Romans. So we'll... As you're turning there, have a couple of things by way of reminder. We're in the portion of the book of Romans that is the part that teaches practical Christian living. The first part of the book of Romans really nailed down 
what salvation is, what being saved is, who it is for, who needs to be saved. And we saw that salvation really was with the gospel message that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. We saw the need for salvation was universal. There are no exceptions. There will be no one who gets to heaven any other way than the person of Jesus Christ. The gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Another word for Greek that we would use and will use today is Gentile. That would be a person who's not Jewish. God's plan is for all men to be saved. His provision for salvation is Jesus Christ. Christ is sufficient where our sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And that's what we learned about. We learned, first of all, who needs to be saved. We looked at who can be saved. And who can be saved? All men can be saved. Jesus died so all men could be saved. We looked at some um, things that people believe, you know, they look at our salvation and how that we are justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And we looked at some wrong conclusions regarding our salvation. Uh, it would seem, following logical thought, that if we're saved by faith alone, simply just trusting Christ and allowing God to do the work for our salvation, then our conclusion would be, if we're saved by faith and we remain saved by faith, then there's nothing we have to do. And the answer to that question is, yes, that's true. But when we conclude that and say there's nothing we do, then our next conclusion is, so I can live how I want to, I can do what I want to, I can continue in sin because of faith. We find that scripture says that's a contradiction. You're not saved from sin so that you can live in sin. You're saved from sin so that you can be free from sin. And that indeed is Christian liberty. And so we saw that section. Then we saw uh, the question in the book of Romans, which is an important question, uh, asked, where does, where do, if, if the salvation is gone from the Jews to the Gentiles, what about the Jews? Is, is the gospel, is the church a Gentile church? Or is it a Jewish church? And the answer to that question is yes. It's a Gentile church and a Jewish church. And they're one. All men uh, get saved the, the same. And the scripture concluded in that there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. God saves men the same. We saw some distinctions in the book of Romans. What's the advantage of being Jewish? Well, much every way. Because under them were committed the oracles of God. And last week, even though we didn't preach in the book of Romans, one of the things that we saw is that God's people have always had the responsibility for the preservation and the propagation of his word. The church is where you should get a Bible from. The church is where God's word uh, should go forth from. It shouldn't, you shouldn't feel as though, well, Walmart prints the scripture. You no, know, the, the, the Bible's a Christian book. And you ought to get it from Christians. Now, it's fine to sell it at Walmart. Fine to get it at a Christian bookstore. But the church is responsible for the preservation and the going forth of the scripture. In the last couple of weeks, we've seen some very practical things. Okay, so now I'm a Christian. God is my judge. He's the one whom I serve. What about government? You know, if the government's not Christian, do I have to obey it? And here we found that the Apostle Paul was very aware that government could be evil. He was not uh, naive. He uh, ended up being put to death by the very government that he said that a Christian has an obligation to obey. And he made some distinctions about what government's responsibility was. And one of the conclusions that we found in it was, I think, a very comforting comforting statement to me, and that is that rulers are a terror to evil and not to good. And it's a good thing for you and I to realize that if we do right and we please God, we don't have to be afraid. You say, Pastor, but what if the rulers are terrible? What if, they're e what if they are evil? Well, since when do God's people have to be afraid of evil? What do we have to fear evil for? Pastor, don't you know? I mean, they could put you to death. Yes. But we're not supposed to fear them who are able to harm our body. We're supposed to fear the one who is able to destroy our body and our soul in hell. And friend, if you can stand before God with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, there's nothing anyone can do that ought to cause you to be afraid. See, we're not afraid of death. Christians have a different perspective. And so we allow government to have its, have its place. You meet a Christian... 
who says uh, that 